This is the Biz News Podcast, one-on-one conversations with experts in business and personal development. More than half of all U.S. adults say they don't feel that they have a stable, well-paying job that enables them to have both a comfortable quality of life and a career path with opportunities for growth. That's according to a recent survey paid for by Goodwill. Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute in Columbus, Ohio, says that's a change that business leaders need to address. She joins us for this Biz News podcast. Maureen, you have a long-earned and well-earned reputation as a person who anticipates and then can leverage business trends. What do you see business trend-wise these days because of all the worries about A, the return of COVID, and B, maybe uh, we're going to head to a recession or whatever it might be, whatever is behind door number three? Goodness, it's it's a, tr- a trickier time now than we have seen. So especially with the war in the Ukraine, certainly continued supply chain issues, that, that seems a no-brainer. I, I was listening to the recording from the World Economic Forum yesterday in Davos, and there was a conversation about P&G and other large uh, manufacturers uh, relocating their production facilities to be regional rather than um, less in Asia, more in like European production in Europe. Uh, one is the the gas prices, two is the shipping. So as we look at change in manufacturing, there's going to be a significant economic cost to build new plants. There's going to be a difference in labor rate and labor laws. So European labor um, labor laws are different than those in Asia, right? So uh, paid leave and um, more focus on also environmental protections in in different regions in different countries. So uh, and so I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Intel just announced its uh, first manufacturing plant in over a decade, and it's a multi-billion dollar investment in our region. If this were a plant in China, the environmental regulations would be different, the labor costs would be different, uh, and they may be using an existing plant. So all of those, I imagine, will contribute to the cost of chips going forward. Now that may be offset by um, government tax abatements. So, so, so the equation is a system-wide equation. But I think um, the pull for labor will be different going forward. We're already in many cases struggling to staff our organizations. And if we reshore things that have been offshored, I I imagine the labor uh, shortage will continue and inflation will continue. Um, That is one thing, uh, Maureen, that I'd like you to... uh, get your ideas on. We just had uh, just about two hours before uh, our recording started, a report out, uh, a survey paid for by, of all people, Goodwill, that said overall 54% of adults do not feel that they have a stable, well-paying job that lets them have a comfortable quality of life uh, and would present a career path with opportunities for growth. And perhaps even more worrisome, among those who already are employed and not in an ideal job, more than two out of three say they need more training or skills to have such a position. What do you advise your clients your, who are looking for leadership guidance? Again, these are multi-sector challenges, right? That, that for organizations, often they are automating and removing a layer of people. Unfortunately, for the people getting removed, those are the least skilled in many cases because they can be replaced by robots and and such. 
and they are not getting trained necessarily as they exit. So this is now a public issue as in they're drawing on employment and other businesses may not be able to hire them because they don't have the workforce training. So now our communities are picking up the cost of workforce training because, because to attract businesses to our community, we need a trained workforce. So I would like to see multi-sector partnerships that are more proactive. It, so how do our businesses partner with our community colleges and our high schools and uh, uh, nonprofits to create a path so that our local pick business X or Y is exiting folks and they, instead of going to jobs and family services to collect their unemployment check, they also, they, the first stop is the workforce development office where they are assessed and they learn what their inclinations and talents are so that they can get into the, uh, the funnel that helps them move on to their next job. I think as, as the combination of businesses, for-profits uh, and government, we need to get better at that because it is costing our businesses and not having talented labor. It's causing, costing the, the tax base cost, um, you know, unemployment and such. And our nonprofits are often chartered to help through this transition. So I think there are solutions that are more systemic than what we have now. We, and we have to figure out how to make it viable for everyone. Well, Maureen, we've been doing these interviews since 2005, 17 years now. And in that period of time, I can't tell you how many CEOs and others have bemoaned the fact they can't find uh, talented people to hire. Uh, 17 years is a long time to be bemoaning things. It sounds like uh, some sort of Dickens tale. Surely there's got to be some, some leader out there that you see uh, who is doing something about it. So I, well, so I'll point to one of my clients who runs Red Roof Hotels, just took over. Uh, so, so most of us have driven by a Red Roof. Some have stayed, some have not. Um, one of his commitments has been increased training. So, and, and balanced with automation. So how do you automate the things that can be automated? right? So we can't find enough people. So they are doing things like housing and employing refugees. That, that program is just starting. So we'll see how it comes out. Um, they've housed people who work for our local Meals for Wheels. So they house people that we don't think about, uh, along with during COVID, they housed truckers and hospital folks. And especially as People are transient, so we don't have enough nurses here. We'll, you know, another community will ship their, their nursing people, in some cases, other countries. They're housing those um, more, I'll call, say, transient workers, as well as uh, weekend vacationers. He's committed to training his executives, so he's making a big investment in senior execs, coaching, successors, hardcore training, not a day, but a nine month program that's uh, training, development, coaching, really helping prepare them to be the next level of leaders. Uh, and then that uh, one of his folks is now certified. They'll co-deliver that, that training down to the next level. So this'll, this will uh, ripple through so that they have a solid pipeline to senior leadership and more effective leaders. Because one of the things we know is people are often promoted because they're good at a role. They're not necessarily good at even basic management stuff. And they don't often get that training. And they certainly don't get leadership training. And I'm talking about a systemic um, understanding who I am as the leader, relating differently and doing tasks differently. So while I 
greatly value tools like LinkedIn Learning, that I would say that is incredibly helpful if I need to deliver performance feedback and I go to my LinkedIn Learning module or any number of tasks. If I want to learn to be a different kind of person and leader, I wouldn't necessarily do six modules on LinkedIn Learning. This is a very different kind of program. And because we do it across the enterprise, it's also changing the enterprises. It changes the humans, right? So if you've got all of your VPs going through the training at the same time, we're also talking about how is this different than what we did and um, building the network of executives who will now also collaborate differently. So um, I, I think they're taking a really effective systems approach and I work with their head of learning and development who is incredibly talented uh, and he is focusing on what is the, the you know, at, at each successive level, they're doing the, the things that we know about, but many people don't do. So what's the career pathing? And then what training do people need to get to, to move to the next level? Often companies just don't have the bandwidth or make the investment, even though it's a good idea. There's lots of stuff that's a good idea. I, I should work out more than I do. I, I just, you know, sometimes don't. Some of us uh, have uh, perfected the workout don't to a uh, uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> but we can all argue that it would be better if we did. Well, so, so they say. Uh, this is a, a new type of leadership, is it not? It is. It, it, so we talk about that, and it, particularly post-COVID, I think it is more relevant. Pre-COVID, we talked about this but organizations could succeed without doing it in many cases. I think now in a time that is more disrupted than we've seen in say 40 years with inflation and um, staffing shortages and supply chain and war and a pandemic, right? And what do we add next? The, the plague of locusts. So we're at a time where we're seeing more disruption than we have seen and everything's global. So I'm, I'm competing now with people in other countries who can provide my service cheaper in, in many cases, right? So I, much of my work's done remotely. Why wouldn't you hire someone from China to do what I'm doing? So, so the challenges we as leaders face are broader, deeper, and how I have to show up and, and um, Doug, it, we talk about this as shifting from the old, most of us have seen NCIS. I think it's the most popular TV show or it was. So we all know Gibbs or anyone who's watched TV much. Um, kind of command and control, they call him boss. He, he has a series of rules, you, you don't apologize and you know this and that. And I don't, discount the value of that, especially for anyone who works in um, an environment that's dangerous. Uh, one of my clients was um, a steel plant a, and you could tell who didn't follow the rules because they were often missing digits, right? The, when you don't follow the rules, you lose body parts. So there are places where following the rules is absolutely foundational to your safety we are moving for leaders, rules still required for people operating heavy machines, for engineers designing bridges, surgeons who need to you know, sew bodies back and put, put parts the way they belong. For in leadership roles, we are making decisions with not enough information and we're never gonna have enough. Uh, we are having to then course correct because challenges hit that we hadn't anticipated and they're they're nonstop. So if we look at, I used Dr. Fauci during the pandemic and I know there were political points of view all over the place. This is not a political statement. We're moving from command and control to the mind of a scientist. So during the pandemic, uh, the, the person 
making those scientific decisions and recommending courses of action for our country, scientists, continues to collect data, right? We knew nothing, and then we knew almost nothing, and then we knew a little bit more than almost nothing, and yet he had to, to issue policies. Of course they weren't right. We didn't know enough. And we as leaders are in that same spot where we often don't know enough. None of us anticipated we'd be out for two years. Most people thought it was two weeks, right? So we were all making decisions and course correcting. I hypothesize that we will never move back to that world where we can take enough time to make a decision that we know we got it right because the, the changes continue to happen. And so we need to get better at making the smallest decision with the information we have. Now, I realize that's not always, if I'm building a building that I still have to make a decision on that. Many of the things we as leaders decide aren't that. They're, what's our return to work policy? You know, instead of saying, this is what it's gonna be, how about we're, we're going to run a pilot for a month, see how it goes. We're going to get employee input. I may have a point of view as a CEO, right? I'm, I'm sure all of our executives have a point of view. If I test it, then I don't run into the challenges that we've seen some of our companies have. They they issue the policy, everyone's coming back, then a bunch of people quit, then they change the policy. By taking this more incremental approach, um, we've seen it in the agile software space forever, not well forever, for over a decade. So, so for leaders, we need to adopt, I believe, to respond to the volume and speed of change this scientific, I collaborate more because I can't have all the answers and I experiment more. That said, there are things that are mandated by law, mandated by you know laws of gravity. There, there are things we don't experiment with and I'm not saying be ridiculous, but there are things that I think are better done using an incremental approach than a um, one and done approach. It sounds like uh, the future companies ought to have a sign over the door that says agility works here uh, because everybody in the company is going to have to be agile, ready to spin on a dime. Yes, I, I think that is a very astute comment. And yet, as humans, we're also wired for safety. So we don't always, uh, uh, specifically our, our brains are wired to keep us alive. So turn on a dime doesn't always feel safe or comfortable. It's like going through a, a traffic roundabout. You're never quite sure what's gonna come at you from the other direction. Uh, but that's a, that's a discussion <laughs> we'll save for another day. Would you take a moment to uh, tell our listeners and viewers where they can get more information about you and your company? Sure, thank you. Um, go to innovativeleadershipinstitute.com or innovativeleadership.com. We also have a, a book website, Innovative Leadership Field Book. And the thing I am proudest of, we do a weekly podcast, and this is with uh, thought leaders, global executives. We're in the top one and a half percent right now of business podcasts globally. We have a LinkedIn newsletter. So it's, it is the podcast and the blog every week. Generally, the blog is provided by our thought leader guest. And the reason I'm proud of this is one of our commitments is to share solid thinking with leadership thinking with people around the world. And as we know, given economic disparity, we have have and have not countries, as well as have and have not people. My commitment and our commitment is to make as much information available as possible so that we can build 
strong leaders around the world to elevate everyone around the world to just to create um, more equity for everyone. So, so part of our intent is making this information available every week for free to cover topics that leaders may be interested in. And I understand that some of it's really heady and academic, some of it's more practical and applied for mid-level people. So I don't expect that everyone's gonna love all of it, but I do expect that if you listen for a few months or just check into the newsletter, it, and I, if you go to LinkedIn, if you type in innovative leadership newsletter, I think it pops up, that you will find something that is useful for you or the colleagues you work with. Maureen, what would you like to add in the time we have left that we haven't talked about? Probably the thing that is most on my mind is given this time of significant change, all of us have an opportunity to make the world better. And we are all seeing struggling around us in various ways. You know, for those in richer countries, we still have homeless people. For those in the Ukraine, they're struggling with mere existence and staying alive and eating. For those in Europe, they're facing petroleum shortages as, as we navigate away from Russia and toward other sources. All of us are facing global warming. There are a lot of challenges if each of us finds something we care about and put our efforts toward it, whether it's in our paid work or our unpaid work, and just be kind to one another, we make a lot of progress. You've been watching the Biz News Podcast. We welcome your input. Send your email to editor at biznews.com. Thanks for watching.